the costly wounds of love at the cross. My work is not in skill or but win or lose in pride or shame. But in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross, I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is. Satisfied in Him alone. As summer flowers we fade and die, fame, youth, and beauty hurry by. But life eternal calls to us. trust in him no other my soul is satisfied in him in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. I will trust in him no other My soul is satisfied in him alone You may be seated So this morning we are looking at preparing for the Lord's Supper, and we're looking at preparing in a very special way. We often look at the Lord's Supper and communion, and we think of just a rote ritual. We tend to lose what really is going on here and the meaning of it, and so we want to prepare our hearts throughout the worship service, through the songs, through prayer time, uh, to be thinking about the strength that we can gain through communion and the way that we can worship the Lord and honor him. And so uh, the preparation for communion really begins now if it hasn't already. And so let's look to the Lord in prayer uh, as we continue in worship. Our Father, as we come this morning, we come with hungry hearts. Father, in you we put our trust 
Father, you are our rock and you are our fortress. And for your name's sake, we would ask that you would lead us and guide us. Father, we come this morning as sinful, unworthy people who look to the cross of Christ. And we find there our hope. We boast not in our wealth or in what we know or in our skills, but we boast in what Christ has accomplished on the cross. So, Father, I pray for those who are here with difficulties, sorrows, and questions. Father, I pray that you would help us to find in the gospel of Jesus Christ a firm standing that we could uh, resist our enemy, that we could stand, Father. We pray, Lord, for our nation this morning. We think, Father, of our leaders. We ask that you would grant that they would see Jesus Christ and be saved. Father, we pray for the churches in America that we would return to the gospel, that we would return to Scripture. And, Lord, for those churches that are standing strong, I pray that you would support that and that we would exist for your name. And now, Lord, we, we think of um, our missionaries throughout the world, many of them facing difficult times, many of them, uh, some of them experiencing a harvest. We pray that whatever the need is in the moment, that you would help us and help them, that we would understand the mission of the gospel, the great commission, and stand firmly on that. So, Lord, we offer up this worship, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to your name. We ask that through it all, your name would be praised. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Mercy all him and and free for oh my God if thou doubt me amazing love how can it be that love my God should die for me no Condemnation now I dread Jesus and all in him is mine Alive in him my living hand And clothed in righteousness I'm 
I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne, I stand in Him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. You may be seated. So I think it's really <clears throat> important to rejoice in the little things, and this has nothing to do with my message this morning, but I'm just going to put the offer out there. If you would like a rabbit, please let me know. <laughs> I got up this morning, and we have a little rabbit in our garden that keeps eating the tulips. And I looked out at a live trap I set yesterday, and there he was. He wasn't just a little rabbit. He was a big rabbit. So if you take care of rabbits, let me know. It was great to hear my son Lucas upstairs. As I got up early this morning, I heard him say, We got him. We got him. I was excited about that. So, yeah, turn in your Bibles to Luke 22. Luke 22. This morning, we are going to join together in taking the Lord's Supper and because we take communion regularly each month, I think it's easy for us to let our minds drift and to lose the impact of what we're doing with communion. You know, following Christ is a long journey, is it not? And God knows that we need encouragement and fresh strength along the way, and communion is one of the ways that he gives us that strength and encouragement. Now, taking communion doesn't make us Christians, but it does help us to keep following Christ. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about how communion prepares us for spiritual battle. And you'll notice that the, the passages I have listed on the screen are a little bit different than what you have in your notes, because as I continued to develop the sermon, I made a little bit of a shift. But back in 1986, the city of Cleveland wanted to be known as a destination point for families who were on vacation. And so they decided to set a world record by releasing one and a half million balloons, helium-filled balloons, um, into the sky above the city. So for days before the event, a bunch of volunteers were there inflating these colorful helium balloons and they were putting them under a giant net that covered a city block. But the night before the big event, a powerful wind flew, uh, blew through the city of Cleveland. Chairs and objects were being blown around. A couple of fishermen were actually blown out into, the nearby, into nearby Lake Erie. They were reported as missing. 
But thankfully, by and large, the net held and the balloons stayed where they were. And the next day, the big event went forward. So it was this beautiful sight as one and a half million colorful helium balloons drifted up into the sky. Event planners were feeling very good about it. But as is so often the case, they soon realized that they hadn't thought about this question. What's next? So you get one and a half million balloons in the sky. They have to come down somewhere. And those balloons hit a cold front. They hit cold air. And down came over a million of those balloons, fully inflated. And they covered the city of Cleveland. They covered a huge portion of uh, the shore of Lake Erie. And no one thought about what to do Things had gone as planned, and yet they hadn't truly planned. And so they came into contact with, what do we do with this? In fact, the balloons clogged waterways all over northeast Iowa. They scared animals. They landed in the lake. And for days, those balloons were washing ashore on the Canadian side of Lake Erie. It was a disaster. But the worst disaster of all was that while all of this was going on, the Coast Guard was carrying on a search and rescue for the two lost fishermen on Lake Erie. And crews had to call off the search because all of these colorful balloons came down into the lake and it became impossible to tell the difference between the balloons and someone in the water. So they had to call off the search and they never were able to rescue those two fishermen. Something so important as the lives of two men covered and lost because of distractions Those balloons and the distraction uh, came in the way of what was most important. Sometimes I wonder with communion if that's a little bit what happens. The less important things like how we distribute the bread and the juice, maybe a few little nuances in traditions, the way we do it, how often we do it, our familiarity with it can cause us really not to be able to see what's really going on here, to get distracted. And we might lose the fact that communion is intended as a soul-satisfying visual reminder that we have a Savior who loves us. He died for us. He's coming back for us. All of this is expressed and more in communion. And no matter how many times we've heard the gospel, and I don't use that term gospel as a buzzword to refer to everything. It refers to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins. Sometimes we need to vividly rehearse and gain it afresh for a new day, for new trials. And that is what we do at communion. We remind ourselves that we stand in grace So I want to talk about how communion prepares us for spiritual battle. But before I do that, I'd like to ask a few questions. I'd like to lay out um, some basic questions about communion. And lots of questions come about. We think we know all the answers, and we probably know a bunch of them. But this is for us who are familiar with communion. It's also, it could be that you've just started attending Jamestown Baptist. And we'd like you to know what the scriptures say because every church has um, traditions that grow up around communion, little nuances of how we do things. We'd like to show you what the scriptures say. We want you to be fully informed that when we partake of communion, this is what's going on. But I also want to say this for parents here. The questions that I want to pose are the questions, some of which your own children, if you have little kids, have about communion. And so they'll be asking, can I take communion? What is this? What are we doing here? When can I take communion? These are good questions, and they deserve meaningful answers, more than just a textbook wrote, and grandparents for you as well. And so I would encourage you to jot down some notes on some of these questions. Tuck them away for a day when your kids or someone else asks you about communion. And so I want to pose a few questions before we get into how communion prepares us for spiritual battle. The first question is this. What should we call communion? Now, I just called it communion, didn't I? (laughs) There are a number of different names for this activity. 
uh, my preference is either communion or the Lord's Supper. The Lord's table is another term. The breaking of bread we see in the book of Acts. Some call it the Eucharist. Now, of those names, the one that I'm really not so comfortable with is the Eucharist because it can tend, not always, but it can tend to come with a theology that teaches communion is a sacrament necessary for salvation. And communion does not get you saved. It does not get you into heaven. At Jamestown, we usually call it communion or the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table, and each one of those has a biblical passage behind it. Communion actually comes from 1 Corinthians 10, 16, where Paul is talking about the subject. And he uses a Greek term that refers to sharing and fellowship and participating together. And that's one of the things that we do at communion. We're together in this. We are expressing our unity in Jesus Christ. And so in a few minutes, we're going to partake of communion. And I want you to understand what it is that we're doing. And even if you're not a member at Jamestown Baptist Church, if you're a believer um, who is evaluating their lives and assessing their lives, we would encourage you to join that. But communion is correctly termed an ordinance, which means that Christ has ordained it. He has commanded it as a way that we visibly portray the gospel. Some call it a sacrament. However, that term has some biblical or some theological baggage that gets confusing. The term sacrament is often, not always, used in context of something being necessary for salvation. Saving grace only comes not through communion, but by personal faith in Jesus Christ. So what should we call communion? We can call it communion. We can call it the Lord's Supper. We can call it the Lord's Table. It's an ordinance, meaning Christ gave it as a command in an ongoing fashion. Now, what is communion? What is communion? What exactly is this thing that we call communion? And there are lots of ways to celebrate it. If you go to Brazil out in the jungle, you'll find they do it differently than we do it here, but it has the same basic meaning. So I'm going to give you, just as I put together the, uh, the biblical data, uh, communion is the activity commanded by Jesus in which the church consistently, I just mean regularly in an ongoing fashion, eats the bread and drinks the cup as visual reminders of Christ's sacrificial death and the benefits that we receive as, as a result of his work. Today I want to really focus on the benefits of it. Because I did a little poll, I mean a, a small poll, of, uh, of some folks in our church this last week. And I said, I just casually asked, so what is communion? What are we doing with communion? And I got really good answers. You know where I found that we get a little bit vague and a little bit fuzzy and a little bit just kind of foggy is, so what are the benefits of communion? And we get answers like, well, anytime you obey Christ, there are benefits. Right answer. So you say, well, what are the benefits of taking communion? Well, then you get the response, well, should we be looking to get something? Shouldn't we be looking to give something to Christ? Very true. And I'm often concerned about consumerism in churches. We come to get, to get, to get. But Christ has given us communion because he wants us to remember certain things and in the remembering of them if we come in the way that he prescribes we find that we come out of communion stronger than we went into communion because there's a certain strength he gives us just like when you sit down and read scripture and when you share Christ and when you pray and when you join together in a community of believers, there are things that happen that strengthen you. So we're going to talk about some of these benefits. But what is communion? Well, Jesus gave communion as a command and a gift to the church. Take a look there at Luke 22. Luke 22, verses 14 through 20. This is the founding of communion. You say, why do we do communion? Well, it started right here, Luke 22, 14 through 20. When the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 
For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is a command. This is what our Lord Jesus Christ says. This is what he tells us to do. He is speaking these words on the night in which he was betrayed. In just a few hours, he will be arrested on trial. In less than 24 hours, he will be dead, having been crucified. And in this passage, he gives us this command, do this in remembrance of me. Break the bread, drink the cup, and this command was not just for the early apostles and the early disciples were to continue in regular intervals eating the bread and drinking the cup until Jesus returns. How do we know that? How do we know that this isn't just something he gave to the disciples in the early days? Well, in part, 20 years later, the book of 1 Corinthians is written. This is a local church, the Corinthian church, just like Jamestown Baptist Church is a local church. And what is the local church in Corinth doing? They are observing communion. They are doing what Christ has said. And the Apostle Paul says, on that night in which he is betrayed, he took the bread and he took the cup and he tells us to do this. And so what Paul is saying is this is something for every local church in an ongoing way. A command for believers today. And that's why communion is such an important part of what we do as a church. You know, when we are not able to have communion, I miss it. I deeply miss it. Because Jesus told us to partake in it. It's an important part. It's not just an add-on, a tack-on to the end of a service. And he, and he tells us in Luke 22 that this is something ongoing until he returns. 1 Corinthians 11 really lays that out. We proclaim his death until he comes. Now, Biblical churches do it in different ways. Some churches have communion every Sunday. Some have communion once a year. Some churches hand out communion juice and wafers in little packets, and they just take it as you file out the door. <laughs> various churches have various ways of preparing the people to take it. In fact, in times past, if you had lived in Scotland and the Netherlands, guess what? The week before communion came, the elders would show up at your door with a few questions. And what they were seeking to do is to determine whether individuals in the congregation, whether you were fit and ready to partake of communion. And if you were fit and ready, and if you answered those questions correctly, they'd give you a communion token. And you would go to the service, and you would present your token, and they'd say, okay, you are qualified or ready to partake in communion. The sad part about that was that um, typically in most of the churches, only a few of the older, more saintly members of the church were deemed fit. And so that meant that the majority of the congregation never experienced the blessings of the Lord's Supper until way later in life. And there's always a balance in this, is there not? Um, we can come to communion and we can just take it without even thinking about what's going on on the one side. And then on the other side, I've known as a pastor, there are times when people say, I can never take communion because I never feel worthy. And yet scripture says, examine yourself and enter in. If there are areas that you need to repent and confess, confess them before the Lord and enter in anticipating in obedience to the Lord, the good things that are going to come. There are different ways of handling communion. Some good, some not so good. One thing we can say for sure is that communion had its start right here on this night as recorded in Luke 22. Jesus spoke clearly about the purpose. He said, this, the bread is my body. The cup is my blood, the new covenant in my blood. He's not saying that the bread and the cup are the literal physical body and blood of Christ. As Roman Catholic theology teaches 
Jesus is not being literally sacrificed every time we take communion. Christ, according to Hebrews, tells us that he was sacrificed once for all. One sacrifice, done. Aren't you glad? The sufficiency of Christ's death and burial and resurrection, once for all. So here you have, if Christ is sacrificed every time someone takes communion as if new sins require a new sacrifice, can you just think of the logistics of that? Christ across the world, at some point probably communion is being taken almost at any given time. Can you imagine? Um, if that is true, then he's being sacrificed um, almost every hour throughout the world. The problem is scripture never teaches that but the opposite, that he died once for all. Now, the early disciples understood that Jesus is not saying, this is my literal body, my literal blood. They understood him to be saying that the bread represents his body, the blood represents his blood, just as Jesus said in other places, especially in the book of John, I am the door. He's speaking metaphorically. He's not saying, I am the literal door with a door handle and you open the door or however they did doors in those days. He's not saying that. He's saying, I am like a door. Here he is saying, the, the, the bread represents my body. The blood represents, or the, the juice represents my blood. That's how communion came to be a part of our worship because Jesus laid it down as an ordinance. He ordained it. He said, this do as a command. It's not something that we dreamed up. It's not something that we um, just do because it's a ritual. He commanded it. He gave it to us as a gift that if we take it meaningfully, Jesus Christ will be worshipped and we will be renewed in our strength. So let me go on to the next question, and that is this. What is the purpose of communion? I've already kind of hit at some of this. But let's be a little more direct. What is the purpose of communion? Um, verse 19 is very clear. This do in remembrance of me. That's the purpose, to remember. We do this so that we won't forget the great price that Jesus paid and all that was accomplished for us. And you might say, well, why do we need that? Who forgets the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Surely we can remember that much. And it seems odd to us that we would need to be reminded um, by an act like communion. But, you know, we as human beings tend to forget anything more than just bare facts. We get busy in life. We get wrapped up in today. And sure, we remember the facts of Christ's uh, death and resurrection. But our hearts easily slip away from the love and gratitude toward Jesus. We need powerful reminders, and that's why we come again and again to this table. And I think you've got two extremes when it comes to communion. And I want to show you maybe what is a little bit of a, of a danger in a church like ours. So in a church like ours, we believe that this is representing Christ's body and representing his blood, and we base that not just because we believe it, we base that on Scripture, because that is what Scripture says. Now, on the other side of it, you know, we, we can easily tend to just, this is a bare facts. We're just remembering the bare facts, and it becomes cold and sterile if we don't really apply ourselves to it. Now, on the other extreme, the reason we go to that extreme sometimes is because we don't want to fall into the error of saying this is a sacrament that is necessary for salvation. You can see when someone in the Catholic Church or another church that believes this is necessary for salvation, if they're refused communion, that is a big deal to them because they're believing this false theology. And in an effort to, to get away from that, we can easily go to another extreme if we're not careful. So if we skip communion or if we do it half-heartedly, we miss out on some very unique spiritual benefits that we don't quite find anywhere else but in the Lord's Supper. So when Communion Sunday rolls around, let me ask you, what are your thoughts and attitudes? Is it indifference or is it desire? I want to have this closeness with Christ. I want to have this unity with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to join together. Is it boredom or is it anticipation? Do we long for it? 
you know, in the winter of 1988, 1999, and early 1989, two American missionaries were attending a, a retreat in Columbia, South America. And as they were at this receipt, retreat, they were in the middle of a worship service, and ten heavily armed uh, men in fatigues, army fatigues, went into this worship service, and they were drug traffickers, leftist guerrillas, angry that the American government was arresting and having drug lords uh, extradited to the United States for trial. So these guerrillas walk in, and they are upset at Americans. And they began shouting slogans, stating that um, for every Colombian extradited, one gringo would die. Now, they knew that American missionaries were in the area, and they began to question church leaders, asking, who are these missionaries? What are the names? And finally, they identified these two missionaries. So one of those missionaries was a man named Richard Grover from Gospel Missionary Union. And they took Richard Grover along with a fellow missionary. They disappeared into the jungle for 68 days, holding those missionaries captive. Now, during that time, at one point, um, the kidnappers put these two missionaries on a mock trial. And they accused the missionaries of, being, of working for the United States Drug Enforcement uh, Administration. The outcome of the trial would be if they were accused and um, found to be guilty of that, so-called guilty, um, they were going to die. Somehow, these missionaries convinced the guerrillas, that they were not working with the DEA. So they were suddenly released on March 12th, 1989. Now, I was, I think I was a freshman um, in college at that time. And I remember Richard Grover, not long after he was released, came to our school, and I got to sit down with him and talk with him about his 68 days. I got to tell you, to me, he was a hero of the faith. <laughs> He had stood strong in those 68 days. And I sat and I listened as he described what, what, what he faced, the deprivation, the fear, the, the things that he went through in those 68 days. But do you know what I remember the most? I remember that in the middle of all that fear and isolation and uncertainty and the very real possibility that he was going to die, he found himself longing to be able to participate in communion, not as some sort of a last rite, but as a way to gain strength for his ordeal, a way to sense the closeness of Christ, that even as he was suffering for Christ, Christ had suffered for him in a much more infinite way. And so he, and I believe his fellow missionary was with him at the time, put together their own communion service. And they had, I think it was cocoa, as I recall. And I don't remember what they used for the bread. But to hear him talk about that with such vivid memory, that was the thing he focused on. Intense meaning. Communion was a source of strength, a reminder that Christ was with him, a time of worship that he longed for. And the physical presence of Christ is not in the bread, it's not in the juice. But Christ says, where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst of them. And that's the local church. So do we think of communion in that way, or has it become a rote ritual? It's not in how it's distributed so much, as long as it's done in an orderly, Christ-honoring way. Do you dread it, or do you look forward to it? Now, those are some of the questions that we pose about communion, and there are a lot of others, but those are the things that we ought to have in mind, that we ought to teach to our children, and we ought to keep in our own hearts uh, to keep our minds going the right direction. Now, let me just show you, secondly, <clears throat> our final consideration before we enter communion this morning. How does communion prepare us for spiritual battle? I'm looking at people that every single one of you who is a believer, you are in the midst of a spiritual war. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. And I believe that communion corresponds to a certain piece of the armor. Ephesians 6, 10 through 15. <clears throat> communion produces a specific kind of readiness. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. 
and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. These are the things that make for spiritual readiness. The idea here in the text is, you know, it's not like uh, in our spiritual warfare. We want to annihilate the enemy. We, we want this grand and glorious battle in which we come out and we fight and we win against Satan. That's not what victory is for the believer. Victory for the believer is standing. It is withstanding. So Paul is describing here that every Christian faces intense spiritual warfare. Satan targets every Christian. He schemes and he plans and he strategizes ways that he can disrupt and destroy each one of us. Make no mistake, he's not here to toy with you, dear brother and sister. He's here to destroy you. This isn't a game to him. Thomas Brooks said in his precious remedies against Satan's devices, listen to this, he says, Satan has snares for the wise and snares for the simple, snares for hypocrites and snares for the upright, snares for generous souls and snares for fearful souls, snares for the rich and snares for the poor, snares for the aged and snares for youth. And I would just add that he has snares for you. One of the most difficult things about this enemy is we don't see him. In fact... In verse 12, it says we're wrestling against uh, not flesh and blood, things that we can see, people. We're wrestling against, wrestling against principalities and powers and spiritual forces. These are demonic, satanic forces that we can't see. And often our world says if you can't see it, it's not real. Well, what about the radio waves going around us all the time? Information is flowing through this building and you don't even see it. Going from here to China to who knows where else that you can't even see. And what we don't realize and we don't often think or maybe don't think about enough is that there are spiritual forces that we cannot see that are just as real as the chair that you're sitting on. And verse 12 says that we wrestle and we struggle and we think of wrestling as this benign contest. But this is not, this word wrestle is not this benign contest. We just win and we're competing for a gold medal. The idea here is this is hand-to-hand -hand combat. Literally, where two are fighting each other up close and they're trying to stab each other and they're trying to kill each other. This takes intense concentration. The word here for wrestle and struggle is not talking about two armies uh, at a distance lobbing mortar shells at each other. This is individual soldiers very close up, face to face and personal. And dear Christian, you might think that as long as you just ignore it and just don't enter the fight, that Satan won't make you a target. That's wrong. Every believer is a target. In your marriage, in your heart, in your family, in your work, in every area of your life, any breach that Satan can find. This is a fight that only you can face being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The church can't fight it for you. Your spouse can't fight it for you. Your parents cannot fight it for you. This is your fight. It's your temptation. It's your life. It's your attitude. It's your faith under attack. 
And the only way to fight it is not a book full of spiritual warfare prayers or sending money to some health and wealth preacher. The only way to fight it is to be strong in his strength, to be strong in the Lord. And there are cues that clue you in that Satan is attacking you. And I just started looking through Scripture. What are some ways that we can know that Satan is attacking us? And I think we ought to clue into this because there are times where it's like something's going on here and I don't know what's happening. I see several ways in Scripture being overly discouraged or fearful, being overrun by those things can be an indicator that you're under attack by Satan. Our flesh can also do that. Being overly tempted, confusion and fog, and being blinded to the gospel and its effects. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that the God of this world blinds the eyes of unbelievers. Susceptibility to false teaching. Scripture talks about the doctrines of demons. They twist the truth. Satan did that in the garden right at the beginning. Producing division. Being filled with doubt and questioning God. The book of James talks about the fact that, that um, when we become selfish and full of selfish ambition, that demons, demonic wisdom, that's demonic wisdom, pairs up with our own flesh. And Satan loves it when we walk in the flesh because he can exploit us. Satan appeals to the lusts of our flesh. He stirs up division among believers. He gets us to run from the church, to run from our families. He numbs us into lukewarm spirituality. And 1 Thessalonians 2.18, he opposes us when we finally decide we're going to serve God. And that's when things start to pile up. And those are ways that you can know that Satan is likely, he's, he's around, he's a roaring lion. Just look at Job. What does Satan do? Satan is inciting Job through difficulties and hardships to curse God, to turn back on his faith. Spiritual warfare is a very real thing, but it's not what you often read in the books about just come up with these formulaic prayers. Spiritual warfare, the only way to wage it is uh, it requires that we put on God's armor. I remind you of verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It is not saying be a strong Christian. It is being a strong in the Lord Christian. This is how we get ready for warfare. The warfare that's being waged even now. Take up the armor. Take up the whole armor. Put it on. Keep it on. It will enable you to stand. Warren Wiersbe said, Sooner or later, every believer discovers that the Christian life is a battleground, not a playground, and that he faces an enemy who is much stronger than he is. Satan is stronger than we are. And yet greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, here's how communion prepares us for spiritual battle. By observing communion, we are remembering all that Christ has done for us on the cross, and we're reviewing all that the gospel promises. And in so doing, we are putting on the armor listed in Ephesians 6, verse 15. Let me read that again. Stand there, excuse me, well, let's go back to verse 14. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, verse 15, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That is what we're doing in communion. It's like we are putting our foot in the war boot of the gospel that prepares us to stand in the evil day when Satan shoots his accusations, when Satan um, fires at our temptations and uses our flesh and uses fearful things. The Roman soldier had special shoes. They called it a war boot, really. It was more than just a pair of sandals. It was sandals, but it was sandals on steroids, so to speak. They had extremely thick leather on the soles. In fact, they were up to three-quarters of an inch of thick, tough leather. They had metal spikes or cleats 
for traction to help them stand their ground. Every month in training, the Roman army um, in certain units had three 18-mile marches. And so proper protection and preparation and the care of the foot was everything. If you read the histories of warfare, even in modern times, footwear had a lot to do with success in a campaign. So proper protection, proper grounding, even in sports today, proper footwear. Now the point in Ephesians 6.15 is that that the gospel gives us solid spiritual footing. It's your one foundation to know where you stand with God. When you know that you're forgiven, and when you know that your sins have been buried with Christ, and that your life is hid with Christ in God, so that when Satan seeks to stop you, knock you down, destroy you, you can stand. Knowing, as Colossians says, we're complete in him. And that all joy and peace and power are ours through the gospel. That brings a stability and a security that whatever happens, we stand in the gospel. We stand in grace. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 is full of this. We are more than conquerors. And this is not the the cheerleading, rah, rah. This is, no, we are more than conquerors, even though we are slain, even though we are knocked down, even though in Romans 8 it talks about all these difficult things that come against us. We're never separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The gospel declares an end to our war with God and assures us of his favor Now notice what verse 15 here in Ephesians 6 calls the gospel. The gospel of what? The gospel of peace. Peace with God. How much peace do you have in our lives? When Christ died and rose again, all of our sin was paid for. And those, we, who were born enemies of God, whether we wanted to admit it or not, when we come by faith to Christ, a truce is called. Satan has blinded people to this. Do you know why Satan, his his propaganda war often centers around the gospel? You know why? Because the gospel is what sets people free. The gospel is where Satan kind of loses people who would do his bidding. He hates the gospel. That's why he centers his lies often around the gospel in one form or another. He gets us to redefine the gospel. He gets us to undermine who Jesus Christ is. He gets us to undermine who we are. He gets us to think that our sin is not all that bad and we really don't need a Savior. But infinite sin requires an infinite Savior. And we find that in the gospel. And when we come to communion, we are reminding ourselves that we have a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No one is born a Christian. No one just out of the blue decides, hey, I'm going to be a Christian. Someone who is a genuine biblical Christian is someone who has come to the point where they see their sin and they recognize Christ died for that. It was serious enough that he had to pay the price. God had to become flesh to have a body and blood to die to pay for our sins. Putting our faith in Christ... And resting in him is when we actually become a Christian. Romans 5, 1, Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. (laughs) That's the gospel. That's the effect of the gospel. These are the truths that we remember at the Lord's Supper. These are the things. This is why Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. He's not just saying, remember some facts. As I am the bread, eat of me. Let me nourish you. Let me strengthen you. When you go to a meal, you are going to be nourished, to have strength, to live. <clears throat> I appreciate what C.J. Mahaney says. He says, the gospel isn't one class among many that you'll attend during your life. As a Christian, the gospel is the whole building that all the classes take place in. 
rightly approached, all the topics you'll study and focus on as a believer will be offered to you within the walls of the glorious gospel. Now, I think we have to be careful that we don't just put everything under the heading of the gospel. But the gospel is the foundation. Therefore, that's how communion prepares us for spiritual battle. We could go on and talk about the helmet of salvation, the helmet of the hope of salvation. But at communion, it's like we're putting our feet into that war boot so that we can stand. Is that how you view communion? If you view it in that way, your hope and your joy will increase. And you will find that communion is something that you anticipate, that you eagerly look forward to and expect that coming out of it, if you walk into it with the right heart, with the right preparation, examining your life, so this morning we've answered some critical questions about communion. I've also shown you how partaking of communion is a powerful way to prepare for battle. And now we're going to do that. Before an NBA game, the team and the staff often eat a pregame meal. They sit down as a team and they lay out a spread of nutritious food specifically chosen to give them the energy and the strength that they need for the game, which feels a lot like a battle in the NBA, to give them strength. When we come to the communion table on Sunday, you eat the bread and drink the cup, giving you power that you need. We're going to sing a song in a moment after I pray. It's the song, Oh, the Blood. Oh, the blood, crimson love, price of life's demand, shameful sin placed on him, the hope of every man. Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. What a sacrifice that saved my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory. Save your son, holy one, slain so I can live. Oh, see the lamb, the great I am. Who takes away my sin. Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. What a sacrifice that saved my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory. Would you bow your heads? I'd like to ask you if you have come to repentance in Christ, more than just saying that you're a Christian more than just checking that on a box of your religious affiliation, more than making a profession of faith or walking an aisle or being baptized or living in a Christian nation or living in a Christian home, have you come by faith, turning from sin, and receiving Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, slain for you? This is his body and his blood given for you. Our Father, thank you for the truths that we sing about and that we celebrate and that we stand in. And I pray, Father, that you would help us today, right now, to enter communion with hearts and minds even aware of those sins that are in our lives that we need to confess, that we need to bring to you so that our fellowship would be restored. Lord, I do pray that you would work in every heart who may not have come to Christ to convict of sin, of righteousness, and judgment, that each would receive him personally. For it's in Christ's name we pray.
Thank you. You may be seated. I'd like to ask the men to come forward at this time. You can be seated, uh, men. So I invite you today 
if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, to join me in celebrating the table, a dynamic symbol of the faith that we have in Christ, but more than the faith, the Savior. Let's put fresh heart and soul into communion this morning. We come to the table because we're instructed to do that, but we also come because we can. We have this privilege. It's not a testimony of our righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ that has been given to us as a gift. Don't come because of your own goodness. Come because of his goodness and his righteousness. Come because the Lord has instructed, but also come because you love the Lord. You're thankful for what he has done. So lift up your hearts above your cares, your fears, the distractions. Don't focus on the men as they distribute. I would encourage you to take the time during distribution to have a silent time of prayer between you and the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says that we need to examine ourselves. And what are we examining ourselves for? We're looking for things, areas of sin where we've turned away from the Lord, where we confess to him those things. We come back into right fellowship with him as believers. If you're not a believer in Christ, I encourage you just to pass it by and, and do business with the Lord right there on that, receiving Christ as Savior. But you receive the love of God, and when you see the bread, and when you see the juice, remember that you have a Savior who loves you. So men, would you stand? And I'm just going to give you one tray at a time for each hand. I'm going to ask uh, Richard Vargas to pray as we begin our distribution um, of the elements. Gracious Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus, the Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. We ask your blessing upon these elements as we take them, Lord, that we would receive them with gratitude and love, knowing that it is you who have loved us first. May your blessing fall upon your people, Lord God, as we partake in this, remembering that we are one family because of the blood of Christ. It is in his name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Okay.
1 Thessalonians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 8. The Apostle Paul talks about salvation. He talks about it being like a helmet. He says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. And so we are rejoicing in the hope of our salvation. And it's like putting it on as a helmet to guard us and to protect us against the onslaughts of our enemy. 2 Thessalonians 2.16 says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. And it talks about him perfecting us to be made like Christ one day. So that's what we're doing. We're putting on this hope. 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul speaking to the, um, the believers in Corinth. He says, and if you'll take the bread at this time, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, as we take the bread, we remember a Savior who loves us, who gave himself for us, and remember, Lord, that his body was given as the Lamb of God, the once for all sacrifice for our sins, the very things that we might have thought of as we were examining ourselves just a couple of minutes ago. Thank you, Father, that those things that we fight against, the sin in our lives, the flesh, Satan, the worldly system that so easily gets within us, we thank you that our Savior is our champion who has conquered that. We look to Jesus with the eyes of hope and the eyes of victory, knowing that he alone is our victory. And we thank you and praise you for him in Christ's name. Let's take the juice at this time <clears throat> and remember the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And now, Father, as we drink the cup, we remember Jesus and his blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I pray, Father, that we would not miss the great riches we have in Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our final song at this time is going to be um, Jesus, Thank You. And what an excellent song to be thinking of um, as it talks about uh, the riches of Christ's cross. So let's join together wholeheartedly. And I want to remind you that um, after communion, uh, during communion Sundays, we encourage you uh, to give toward our benevolence fund. Um, oftentimes we have uh, plates up here. I don't think they're up here right now, but you can give in the offering pillars in the back as well. And just note on your gift that that is for benevolence. Um, Let's join together in singing our final song. Let's stand together. We'll sing Jesus. Thank you. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your son. Drank the bitter cup preserved for me. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. 
Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. By a perfect sacrifice, I've been brought near. of your glorious grace your mercy and your kindness know no end your blood has washed away my sin Jesus thank you the Father's right completely satisfied Jesus thank you once your enemy now seated at your table Jesus, thank you. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's right, completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Washed away my sin, Jesus, thank you. The Father's right, completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. Let's go in the joy and the strength that we've just received, and let's share that with others around us. We'll see you in life groups. Reminder, we do have membership class right up here uh, immediately following the service. Thanks for coming. You're dismissed.